Good afternoon um, and welcome to the Middle East Coffee Break, dire Middle East Direction Coffee Break. Uh, we are presenting today this book, extremely rich uh, edited book, Democratic Transition of the Arab World, authored by Ibrahim El Badawi and Samir Makdisi, who is here today, with contribution of Nohal Mikawi. And we just presented it today at our seminar. You were um, referring to many issues. It's a four-year uh, research project uh, start, starting just after the uprising. A lot of things have changed in terms of research, in terms of questioning. Uh, the, first, um, the first question you were referring to today, Noha, was this um, common grounds that the two big countries that had the revolutions, Tunisia and Egypt, had, like in the cross you know, a cross comparison you, you made between the two countries. What were these common grounds? Mm. Yes, uh, the book you were talking about has a number of case studies, not only Egypt and Tunisia. Uh, each one of them is a rich uh, case study of a country uh, in the region. But indeed, Egypt and Tunisia stand out as being the two countries where the uprisings have led to some change. Um, the jury is still out, of course, on where that change will lead us. But uh, when looking at Tunisia and Egypt in particular, one sees some points of common ground, that, that common drivers, so to speak, as well as some variations that might explain where Tunisia is right now versus where Egypt is. The common uh, factors that were present in both countries leading up to the uprisings are, number one, an economic success story. Both of them were seen by observers at the time to have been economic success stories with high uh, rates of economic growth, high relative to the region uh, in which they exist. But indeed, both of them had economic growth success stories with less job creation than is to be ideal. What some people call jobless growth. Both countries were observed to have had this phenomenon of weak ability to create jobs, particularly for the increasing population of young people in both uh, countries, which led to another common ground between both, which is high uh, unemployment rates for the young particularly the educated young, which leads to a third common ground uh, between both countries, which is the pervasive presence of the informal sector as the only place where the, uneducate, where the educated, unemployed young would find or create their own jobs. So the informal sector seems to have been the place where uh, most of these people had to go for income generation, but not for social security, nor for economic security uh, in general. That's part of the story of what the informal sector does to um, uh, the young and to economies in general. Another common ground between both countries is the regional disparities that were observed between rural and urban areas, uh, or between the coastal line and the inland of the country. Gender disparity was also high. Uh, in both countries. And finally, very low rates and scores on political freedoms in general, and particularly high scores of corruption uh, in both uh, countries, also linked to the dominance of the ruling family uh, and its interests in the economy in both countries. These were the common factors that led in both countries to the uprisings that we saw. And uh, Samir Makdisi, I mean, econo and economically, you've been studying the big trends in the economy in the region for a long time. Uh, there's been really a problem between um, labor, capital, especially you were referring to um, the, the question of uh, economy of services that can be actually um, a problem in, in, in the society. Why? Well, I mean, uh Perhaps I should say that the Arab world, on average, has been doing rather well prior to the uprisings of 2011. 
uh, at least measuring development in terms of rate of growth. I'm not talking about the quality of development, but in terms of quantitatively speaking. Uh, nonetheless, uh, although the Arab world was faring relatively well, uh, you will find that, and the middle class was, in, was growing and education was spreading, uh, nonetheless you find that uh, there is sort of an ex exceptionalism that has taken place, what we call Arab exceptionalism, whereas in other regions of the world there has been a correlation, a positive correlation between uh, economic development, uh, growing middle class, growing education, and a move towards democratic governance. This has not been the case in the Arab world, at least until 2011. And this has been termed as the Arab exceptionalism, or the fact that the Arab countries remain basically autocratic, whereas in the other regions of the world they had been developing towards some form, maybe partial democracy, but some form of democratic uh, governance. Now, uh, the uprising sort of changed this uh, scenario and it un unleashed potential forces that have probably have not yet been, you know, completely felt. But uh, there have been forces for toss change and it is something that has shattered in a way what has been termed Arab exceptionalism. The problem is that uh, in the five, six countries where uprisings have taken place, a change has taken place, it has not yet led to the aspired form of reg political regime, open political regime that one would have liked to see, except perhaps Tunisia. Tunisia has succeeded. But the other countries, four of them are now, uh, or three or four, have been witnessing very brutal civil wars. Uh, in the Egyptian case, it has been rather protracted transition. So we have, they have not really moved in that direction. But when you look at history, you look at the experience of other regions of the world, you find that uh, this has, uh, this not, it has not always been the case that when you have a change from an autocracy, it necessarily leads to democracy. It could be from autocracy to autocracy or autocracy to anocracy. So there's no direct line necessarily. So, so we should not be surprised that the, the, the movements that began, the uprising that began in 2011 have, are yet to bear uh, fruits. Uh, this does not mean that there aren't some good signs or future signs that will lead to a good change in the Arab world because of what the studies have shown, including Egypt and Tunisia and others, that ultimately as the uh, modernizing influences become stronger and, and expand, uh, you find that there are it, it, ha it exerts a positive influence on moving from autocratic governance to some kind of democratic governance. And you find that as uh, countries liberalized economically, they have open economic systems, uh, it becomes more and more incompatible with remaining in a closed political system. There's some kind of incompatibility and ultimately this will produce change. And I think, as you mentioned before, uh, that, you know, there is a popular demand for freedom. People would like to have democracy. And when you look at all these three factors interacting together, you find that there is some hope that things will ultimately change to, to the better. And speaking of democracy, I mean, you've, you've, also, had, you've also made um, a very big effort in conceptualization of democratic transition, of really the concept of transition. And that led to a, um, a questioning of actually where, to, where you, you were going when we're speaking about democracy. And you were referring to the fact that in the world today, the democratic uh, impulses are not, are not that great as it was before. I mean, they're not such a model today. Yeah, what we are saying is that in comparison to previous waves of democratization, whether in, in Southern Europe or in Latin America, where liberal democratic values were actually on the rise and dominating the international scene of standards, we are living a very awkward and new moment 
for any wave of democratization to happen nowadays. What is this awkward moment? It's a moment where liberal democratic values are questioned, doubted, if not threatened and attacked by right and extreme right forces. Democratic institutions, such as parliaments and political parties, are actually in all opinion polls across the world getting lower scores than ever before. Um, freedoms such as freedom of the press is being questioned, attacked. So we are living a very different moment than ever before. Does that mean we'll have to redefine democracy as we know it? I don't know. But what we know for a fact is that some of the institutions of democracy, such as political parties, have to go back to the drawing board and ask themselves very serious questions. Some of the procedures of democracy, such as elections and the like, which are now being attacked by some democratic players in certain democratic countries, need to question themselves so that they become again democratic processes that are worthy of trust and confidence of the people. And some of the basic values of liberties and freedoms need to again reassemble support, popular support for them. And we see that happening in different parts of the world. So we're, we're not claiming that democracy has to be redefined. We're only saying that the global neighborhood effect is very different than it was in other waves of democratization in the past. And it's a crucial moment for researchers and practitioners to engage with, with right now. And um, one of the, of the big um, evolution that happened after the revolutions were the rise of uh, fundamentalism and especially the, the jihadism, I mean, really the taking of weapons. Uh, you, you were saying that you actually, the, the book bet on the fact that it's not going to be successful in the future. On what do you base, on what exactly do you base your, this uh, optimistic approach? In one word? Yes. Anti-historical. I think that uh, the lessons of history teach us that, you know, this kind of movement will not really have a lasting influence. Uh, and what we are seeing now, in fact, is that uh, they are the people are awakening to this fact uh, and, and the, the trend is actually changing uh, towards lesser influence of fundamentalism. What we pose, in fact, in the book is that were the fundamentalists to gain the upper hand in a very significant way, then the whole concept of democracy has to be re-examined. What are we talking about? Not the kind of democracy that we have in mind. And we, before the reasons I just mentioned, is that uh, we don't think that they could possibly have a lasting influence it's because of the fact, as I mentioned, that there are modernizing influences taking effect. There are economic systems being opened up. There are neighborhood effects. We live in one global world and we simply cannot be isolated from what's happening elsewhere. And people do believe in freedom, do believe in democracy, and I think they will fight for, for these things. So these are good reasons, I think, to, to assert as to why the book implicitly said that we are assuming that these fundamentalist forces will not really prevail. Yes? Okay, may I, let me add something to what Samir has just said uh, with respect to the, why do we believe that uh, there is some hope in recession of fundamentalist violent uh, uh, trends in the, in the future? partly because they are only um, any, uh, a consequence of something else that is not happening right now. In other words, the more democratic institutions and societal movements channel particularly youth anger, but not only the youth, it goes, anger goes across the board in any society, the more democratic societal institutions and processes know how to channel and mobilize this anger in a positive manner, the less reason and ground there will be for violence 
atrocious fundamentalism to continue to grow because it's only a reaction to the anger that liberal institutions and democratic institutions have not successfully and effectively channeled and mobilized positively in the past. This is the moment for us to take that into control. Uh, I, if I may add yeah. to what Noah said, uh, I think the, the great question the Arab world is facing is not whether there's going to be change. I think this is inevitable. It will be counter-historical if change does not take place. It's a question of the period. I mean, how long will this take? How long will the, uh, the, the triggers for change overcome still important existing elements that resist change, such as a very conflictual environment, such as the fact that they still have corrosive influences of uh, you know, oil wealth, that has not been properly used or sometimes improperly used for particular reasons uh, and other factors as well. So the question is, uh, how long will it take for the force of change to counter the forces that are uh, resisting change? Eventually, it, the, the, the force of change will, I think, prevail. On this uh, optimistic note, <laughs> I would uh, thank you a lot uh, for your participation, really. And um, really, a democratic transition in the Arab world, kind of, it's like an amazing and extremely rich, rich edited book. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.